Hi. We're going to do something funny. Yes. We're going to throw your parents under the bus a little bit today. Fun stuff. All right. Are we ready? Name something your parents ask you to do that you do not like doing. And they ask you over and over and over again. Hard to think. <laughs> oh, okay. Doing my math. Oh, you don't like doing your math? Okay, what about some chores around the house? Dog pooping. Oh, wow, Krista. Cleaning your room. Okay, you thought about something else? Cleaning after my dog. <laughs> yeah, the dog poop. Okay. Oh, okay, of course. Lily can't slam her door. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Alex, do you move the... All right, so do you know what that is? It's a clit. Soccer clit. Well, do you want to know what my dad had me doing when I was your age? I had to polish those things. And these are modern, you know, you see how they are nice, leather. 30 years ago, they were plain, like they, you didn't have that much stuff, but you still have the white and you had the, the black in there. And you would say, what is wrong with your dad? Well, he wanted his clits very clean and polished because he plays soccer twice a week, okay? And it was a field and it was muddy, so he wanted his cleats very shiny. That's what I had to do twice a week. On top of it, I used to go to a Catholic school, so we have uniforms. And that meant that I had to polish my own red shoes every night. So sometimes my dad would come from work and he would say, Diana, I have soccer game tonight. You know how bad that was? I couldn't play with my friends because I had to polish his cleats, I had to polish my shoes then, I had to do my homework, so there was no way I could get out and play, okay? So, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen this before. You know what this is? Yes, I had to use this black shoe polish and the brush. You see the size of the brush? It was close. So here was the deal, what I had to do, which I enjoyed. I had to go around between the white line and the black line, and I had to make sure the white didn't get black with this. So you know how long it took me to do that? I cannot get the black on the white. So one day, my dad came from work, and guess what he said? I have soccer game tonight, and I was just, I had enough. And I was like, you know what, dad? Because you had to present a ca case to my dad to be logical. I said, I am tired of polishing your shoes. I am the only one in the house that does it. I cannot play with my friends. I cannot do anything other than just polish your soccer cleats. You're just going to have them dirty anyways, right? You know what he said to me? That day, my dad changed my life forever. He said, do you know why I pick you to do my cleats? Because you are the best. And I just look at him and I was like, I just smile. And he said, you are the best out of your siblings. You are, the, you are the most detailed, perfectionist. And every time I go to the field with my brand new cleats, my friends say, how come you have four new cleats? And he always said, because I have a very talented daughter. See what I'm saying? And that day, every time my dad came from work, I was like, ready. My brush in hand, I was just ready to get over, go on, on those clits. 
So you see my lesson? He picked me because I was the best. So remember, when your parents ask you to do something around the house, it's because you are the best at it, okay? You know where we learned that also from? The Bible. It's in Proverbs. It says God wants us to always give our best on everything we do. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? So remember, every time you're asked to do something at school or at home, you are picked because you are the best. Okay? You can go back to your seat. Our scripture today is John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might, through him might be saved. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Our speaker today is our very own Pastor Michael G. And we look forward to a special message from God as, as he speaks. Good morning, church family. How are y'all doing today? Good? Did you have a good week? You survived the flood, it looks like. So, depending on where you were, I was here Thursday afternoon and we got a massive downpour. It was great. It was like being back on the East Coast. And, uh, and, the, and it took the humidity with it. So when the storm came and went, it, it was gone. So now it's fresh air again. Well, this morning, I'd like to spend a little bit of time diving into a topic that at face value, you might say, well, Pastor Michael, this is elementary in a way. This is a, uh, something that we all know, that we've all seen, we've all studied before. Um, but I want to share something that, as I was going through this study, that uh, it just it clicked in a different way uh, for me. And I hope this morning I'll be able to do that justice for all of us here today. And that I pray that also, that as we go over this topic it will give you a, um, a springboard, maybe a catalyst for your own personal study to dive into this topic, to really get to the heart of what does it mean when we ask the question, what does it mean when Jesus dies for us? When we say that, what does that really mean? And so a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, in fact, um, oh, I probably need to do something, don't I? Nope. Okay. Oh, it's on my face. Okay, gotcha. Well, I'll put it that way. Okay, very good. All right. Let's see here. So, do you see the value? Okay, that's the title of this sermon this morning. And before we begin with it, I would just invite you to join me for an additional word of prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be able to come together in the house of the Lord, to be able to pray, to fellowship, but also to study your word. And God, we just want to pray that right now that the Holy Spirit would fill this place to captivate our minds and our hearts. And for those who are joining with us online, I pray, Jesus, that you would uh, enter into their homes and join them there. And I pray this in your name now. Amen. I don't know if you all saw this on the news uh, two weeks ago. Elon Musk, he made an offer to buy Twitter. Did you see this? Yeah? Uh, some of you all are like, what is a Twitter and, uh, and how many does he want to buy, Right? Um, do you remember how much he asked, uh, uh, how much he offered? What was the price? Like $43 billion, right? Somewhere in that neighborhood, okay? That's a lot of money. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen $43 billion recently, uh, especially after they stopped sending those stimulus checks, you know. Um, no, $43 billion is a lot of money. And when we say that, and when you would hear people on the news say, hey, Elon Musk offered $20, $43 billion, they say it as, a, as if that number, number is commonplace, as if it's, oh yeah, we deal with those kind of numbers all the time, right? Well, I would like to just take a moment to look at what does $43 billion look like, okay? So that way we can kind of understand what the value is of that kind of a number, okay? Because it's, it's not just, an, a, you know, when we say it, it's kind of abstract. Well, let's, let's put it into the tangible kind of uh, numbers. So, if you were to spend $20 every second continuously, 
nonstop, how long would it take for you to, to spend $43 billion? Okay? Not quite as long as you might think. It takes you about 68 years, all right? Just right north of 68 years. That's one second, $20 every second for 68 years, okay? And about a month. That's a long time, all right? Okay, that seems a little bit abstract still. Let's see. You guys like F1? Anybody here a Ford person? Anybody like Ford? Okay. Ford, built tough, right? Okay. So, so the new 2022 F-150s, if you can buy them at the MSRP, uh, they're around $30,000, okay? So how many of these vehicles could you buy for $43 billion? Anybody want to give a guess? Oh, you can buy all of them. That's right. You can buy as many as you want. Yes, sir? 3,300, okay, so that's a lot. That would be a whole bunch of them at that, at that price range, right? You, in fact, you can buy 1,433,333, 3, 3, 3, right? Okay, so you were very close, okay, just, uh, just a little bit off, but you had a lot of the numbers right, okay? That's a lot of trucks, okay? We could fill up the parking lot several times over, I think, and the neighbors, too. So you could also purchase 86,000 homes at the price tag of $500,000 apiece, that's a lot of homes, okay? And you like Taco Bell? Adventist, right? You guys like Taco Bell, right? Uh, you like the Burrito Supreme? You like tacos, those kind of types of things? Well, you don't, I, that number was too extreme to try and buy a burrito. Well, you could buy how many Taco Bells, okay, for that number? You could buy 22,631 at the franchise estimate of 1.9 million each, okay? That's a lot of Taco Bells. And then if you were to make $100 an hour and work eight hours a day, 365 days a year, how long would it take you to earn $43 billion? Right shy of 150,000 years, okay? That's a long time at that kind of a rate, all right? So when we say $43 billion, sometimes it feels very abstract, but do these numbers feel normal, Okay. These numbers, you don't even feel the number, but it's something that we can try to begin to understand what that number looks like in reality, all right? Now, the question that I've got this morning is not about Elon Musk and his, his desire to buy Twitter, uh, but it's fascinating using that as a catalyst because he saw the value of something, and he says, you know what, I've got the cash in my pocket willing to pay for it because I see that it has this intrinsic value, okay, of $43 billion, and so sometimes what we do when we're talking about the plan of salvation, and the thing that I don't want to do today is to pass over the statement that Jesus died for, to save us, okay? Sometimes we say that, or Jesus died to save us from our sins, okay? We say this, but we really don't spend a whole lot of time digging deep and looking at what does that actually mean, what is the value of that kind of a statement? What is the value of the sacrifice that was given to us? And so the question, what does it mean when we say that Jesus died for our sins? That's going to be our guiding question this morning. So just a quick overview. When you looked at sin entering into uh, the, the story of the Bible, in Genesis, in the beginning, everything was perfect. During in the Garden of Eden. Everything is great. All of a sudden, Adam and Eve, they sin by eating of the forbidden fruit. And then right there, we find that there's a lamb slain in that situation, okay, to cover them with garments of skin, tunics of skin. We'll read a verse here in just a moment to explain that. And then throughout the Old uh, Testament, you find the sanctuary service. And throughout the sanctuary service, there's a lot of different animals, lambs included, that are used as a sin offering and as well as other types of offerings but here we find lots of lambs slain during that process. And now you notice that the, uh, the altar of sacrifice in the Garden of Eden was probably a pile of rocks. Here, y'all have seen this. We've got one of these uh, in the sanctuary service. It was a very well-built, with horns and everything like that, uh, an altar of sacrifice. And yet the altar of sacrifice transitions now in the New Testament to the cross. And there we find the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So here are some texts to back these things up. In Genesis, um, Adam and Eve and his wife, oh, 
Ad, no, Adam and Eve and his wife. That sounds like, okay. Let's just back that up real quick, all right? Got to remember what my address is here. All right. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Revelation 13, 8 refers to Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here we find those two aspects coming together. Then in the sanctuary service, this is what we read. There's a lot about this is the sin offering. Um, talking about he the sinner shall lay his hand. So let me pause real quick. Say in the Old Testament, the way that I would have sin in my life, the way for me to get rid of the sin in my life would be to go through the sacrificial system that God had ordained. Okay, So in order for me to have the sin removed from me, sac a sacrifice must be made. So this is what it tells us had to be done. And he, the sinner, shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. And then the priest shall take some of its blood with, the, with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. And then talks about what to do with the fat there. And then it says, And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So the priest shall make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. This was the process to have my sin transferred from me now to something else. Okay? In this case, this was a goat. In this case, for the sin offering right here. Um, but this would be transferred from me to the animal, and then from the animal into its blood, and then from its blood into the sanctuary. Okay? And that's why on the Day of Atonement, on the tenth day of the year, the seventh month of the year, um, all the sin would be removed, it would, the sanctuary would be cleansed, all that sin that had been put into the, to the sanctuary all throughout the year is now being removed, okay? Uh, that's not what we're studying here today, but in our, just a little plug for our Daniel and Revelation class, for anyone who is interested, Mondays and Thursdays at 6 p.m., we will meet right here in the library for a Daniel and Revelation class. Some of these topics that I'm covering a little bit today, we spend a lot of time to go in depth in that class. I would invite everyone to come to that. It's really cool. So, so this is what it says for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Look what it says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. It says, And walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for what? A sweet-smelling aroma. Here we find the same language referring to Jesus' sacrifice as referred to the sin offering in Leviticus. Okay, so now Jesus is becoming the sin offering for us in the same way. And then we go to the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21-24, through 24, it reads... For to, for, to you, uh, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, to him, who himself did what? bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that is the cross, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, the language we find in Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, okay? Prophecy about what Jesus would do for us, how he bore our sins. And then John the Baptist sees Jesus approaching from afar, and in verse 129 of John, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here we find Jesus in direct language being referred to as the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So, what is sin? Okay, And uh, what is the sin of the world? Let's ask those two questions and see what the Bible tells us. So, the sin of the world, all right? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come, sh uh, come short of the glory of God. When it says all, who does that include? Everybody, right? What about the people inside this church? Does this include us? All right, can we be honest about that? Yeah, is, 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 does the Bible say it like it is? 
Sometimes I need to be honest and say, you know what, I am a sinner, and therefore I do need to receive every gift that Jesus wants to provide for me in my life, okay? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Is death. And when it says the wages of sin, in other words, when you go and you sin, the paycheck that comes in the mail is what? Death. This does not sound good. Man, I'm going to quit that company real quick, right? Now, some of y'all, yeah, you know, yeah. all right, we'll just move on. All right, let's keep going, all right? I get, sometimes I get excited. You'll get used to it. I'm sorry. Um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you glad that we have the good gift that Jesus wants to give to us? This is a good gift that God wants to give to each and every one of us, okay, that we can all have. So let me ask the question, since everyone has sin, let's find out what it is. What is sin? Okay. Again, you'll say, Pastor Michael, this feels uh, elementary, this might feel basic, this might feel routine, we've covered this before, but entertain me because it all paints the picture of the value of what Jesus has done for us. So again, what is sin? 1 John 3, 4 tells us, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is what? The transgression of the law. Okay? When we're in this broken relationship with God, our natural inclination is to go against the holy precepts of His law. The moral law that teaches us how to love God and to how to love each other. But when my selfish heart is, is holding and driving and steering the wheel, next thing you know, I'm doing things that please myself that might not please God or might not please my brother or my sister or my neighbor. Okay? So this is what sin is. Now, when we talk about it in reference to the law, sin is a direct breaking of the law. Let me ask the question, who is the lawgiver? Who is the lawgiver? Okay. We say God, right? Let's, let's open this up a little bit. All right. Who is the lawgiver? This is where we find, there's two places in the Bible where you find the Ten Commandments in their totality. Exodus chapter 20 is one of them. Exodus chapter, I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 5 is the second place. Okay. So here in the Exodus account, and it would read similarly in the uh, Deuteronomy account, it says this in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And because of that, I'm giving these commandments. Here's the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? So what is the identifying characteristic of the law-giving God? What is, what is one of the characteristics that we read about in this text? What gives him the authority to give us the law? That's right, he brought us out of bondage, right? So I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So this is the God who's the law giver, all right? Now let's see a little bit about this interaction that Moses had with this God, this, this deliverer, this one that's bringing them out of the house of bondage. This is Exodus chapter 3. This is when Moses is in his time in the wilderness and he's tending sheep and he's walking along and he sees this great sight. Okay? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, it tells us that um, uh, Moses is walking along, he sees this burning bush and he turns aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Okay, he wants to figure out what's going on with this bush. And as he approaches it, he realizes because the, the, something starts talking to him out of the bush. And that it's not just something, it is God who's talking to him. And the, the, the God tells him, hey, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And so Moses is afraid. He is now in the presence of God. He is scared because now he's experiencing something that he did not expect on his normal walk that day. And then God tells him that he wants him to go with a message back to Egypt to Pharaoh and to the children of Israel. A very specific message to, that, that God is going to bring them out, okay? And to let Pharaoh know, let his people go. And so, that's where we pick up in verse 13. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, 
Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name for how long? Forever. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. Now, what's interesting when we read I am? When we read I am, it is a declaration to be self-existent. Okay? This is the self-existent one who is speaking to Moses. And none is self, self-existent except for God himself. Okay? Because everything else receives its life, re- derives its life from God. And so here we find the self-existent God, the creator. This is the God of heaven and earth. This is the one who is in this lowly form in this bush. He is speaking now to Moses to give him this message. Now, does this name, because it says, this is my name forever, and and this is my memorial to all generations, does this name, the I am, does that sound familiar? Do we read that anywhere else in the Bible? In the New Testament, perhaps? Okay. John chapter 8, all right? Remember the guiding question that we asked? The guiding question is, what does it mean when we say that Jesus died for us? Specifically, Jesus dying for us? Okay, John chapter 8, starting in verse 53, Jesus is having an interesting dialogue with the religious rulers of his day, and they ask him this question. They say, are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and of the prophets who are dead? Then they ask a very pointed question. Who do you make yourself out to be? Huh, Jesus? Who do you make yourself out to be? That's the question that Jesus is going to answer here. And then in verse 56, he continues, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus claiming to be here? He is claiming to be God. And not just a God. He is claiming to be the self-existent one who spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Okay? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage in Egypt. This is who Jesus is claiming to be. And make no mistake, I don't have it up here on the board, but 59, verse 59, the Jews understood clearly what Jesus was trying to tell them and what he said and what he claimed to be. Because what did they do in response to this? They picked up stones. That's right, John. They picked up stones and they were going to kill him because they knew that what he had said, he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the the, God. the self-existent one, the one that derives his life from no one. Isn't that interesting? This is beautiful. Think about this. I got onto this topic because I was really studying a lot about the Godhead, okay? A lot about what does it mean when we talk about the Trinity, for example? What do we mean when we talk about the Godhead? And this is such a, a huge topic, and I'm spending all this time studying this uh, for two years now in this topic on and off again. And coming to this text, when I'm reading about uh, or getting prepared last week for uh, the resurrection, for the crucifixion, um, and thinking about what kind of message to put together about the sacrifice, it dawned on me. It dawned on me what Jesus did for us in a way that it, I knew the textbook answer But it clicked in a way inside of my heart where God grabbed my heart in a way that had never been grabbed. Okay? And that's why we're spending this time this morning doing this. So Jesus claims to be the self-existent God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who upholds the world in his hand. Okay? The one who is outside of time, space, and matter. The one who invented these things. Okay? He is one with the Father in all time, in all space, in all ways. It's a beautiful idea of what, he, what love looks like. But let's continue. So they asked him, what do you make yourself out to be? Jesus said in answer to them, I am. 
1 Timothy 3.16, it says, God was manifested in the flesh. And it continues to describe the earthly ministry and ascension of Jesus there. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. This is what Jesus did for us. Again, the question, why would Jesus have to die for me? I mean, we're talking about, when we say Jesus died for me, we're not talking about like a, a lamb anymore, okay? You realize who we're talking about, okay? This is the self-existent God who is holy, who is beyond any of our wildest imagination about, about who and where and how he is. This is who we're talking about died for us, okay? Why would Jesus have to die for me? Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, okay? So he's coming to live the law and the prophets for us. Now, when he says the law, here we're talking about the first five books of Moses, and when he says the prophets, we're talking about the stuff that comes after that, okay? Now, in the book of the prophets, one of the prophets, Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 20, it tells us the soul that sins shall do what? It shall die, okay? We studied this Thursday night a little bit in our class, in our prophecy class, 6 o'clock. Everybody's welcome. Um, it says the soul that sins, it shall die. Now, let me ask you this, okay? Remember, the, the wages of sin is death. Sin is so awful that its wage is death. It's so bad. You know, when we think about the little white lie kind of thing that we want to do, right? Um, you, you've just done your taxes, hopefully. And uh, there might have been the temptation to claim 20 children on there, all right, that were all born last year for that child tax credit. Um, I hope it didn't come knocking on your door, but you, you get the idea, right? We all face this same kind of struggle, the same kind of battle. But yet the Bible tells us that the soul that sins shall die. What death are we talking about here? Because every day around this world, faithful believers who love Jesus and have a vibrant relationship with Him breathe their last. Every day. Okay? It happens all the time. So is that the death that Jesus is talking about? No. He's talking about the final death. Let's get into that. Okay? The final consequence of sin is Revelation 21, verse 8. It says, but for the cowardly and for the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Okay, this is pretty inclusive for everybody, okay? Um, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns, or the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is what? The second death, the Bible tells us. Hebrews, let's, go, let's pause there for a second, okay? So again, from this second death, there is no resurrection from this one, okay? This is a, a final payment, the final consequence of sin. And why, again, would Jesus have to die for me? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remember, throughout the Old Testament, we find in the Garden of Eden, a lamb was slain to cover them with the tunics of skin. During the sacrificial system, lambs and goats and everybody else were slain because in their blood, with the, with the shedding of their blood, that's how they had forgiveness, the promise of forgiveness, okay? We studied that in, he, in the book of Hebrews last quarter. And so when Jesus comes to die for me, it says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Notice this. Jesus is both of these things. He is both the lawgiver and he's also becoming the sacrifice in order to satisfy the rules of the law, the stipulations that you and I must meet, Jesus comes to do that for us. Because all of those lambs throughout the Old Testament, every bit of them were pointing right to Jesus. If Jesus had not have come and done what he did for us, those lambs would have not meant for anything. Okay? They were all a type pointing to Jesus. Okay? They were looking and pointing 
to Jesus. You see, his law is so holy and so unchangeable, and the consequences of breaking his law are so eternal that there's only one way to save us from it. There was only one way. You see, that's the, that's the beautiful thing. Because what does Peter tell us? Remember when we read First Peter? Jesus became something for us, didn't he? He became flesh, yes, but he also became, starts with an S, ends with an N, sin, okay? He became sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us and bore our sins on the tree. Jesus, he loves you and I so much. The all-powerful, self-existent one loves us so much that he would become the very thing that he hates the most in order to give you and I the chance of having salvation. Let's look at this a little bit deeper, okay? You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? You remember the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is uh, under an incredible amount of pressure. He is uh, right there at the end of his earthly ministry, and in the balance is weighing the decision of will he go through with this or not, okay? Three times he prays to the Father, Lord, take this cup from me. And it says that the Bible tells us that he it was under such incredible stress that he did what? He started to sweat something. Blood, okay? And this is a, a, a physiological um, uh, event that really does happen. Under an incredible amount of stress, the person's capillaries will, bl- will b- burst uh, in, their, in their skin, and it will come out through the pores, okay? It's been documented just a handful of times. Jesus is, is one of them, okay? So here he's under this incredible amount of stress, and he prays that the cup be taken from him. Now, let me ask you this. What was in the cup? What was in the cup? Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. It tells us, Unrepentant sinners also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Verse 21, verse 8. Their part will be in the lake of fire, which, uh, lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see that cup that Jesus was contemplating whether he should drink or not? It was the cup that was poured out for you and me. And for everyone else who has sinned, which is all, we all will either drink that cup or let Jesus drink that cup for us. You see what's going on here? And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's saying, Lord, take this cup from me. If there be any other way to save them, let it be so. But the Father says, no, this is the only way because the consequences are so great. It's eternal death. The only way to outrule it, to counteract it, is with eternal life. Who alone has eternal life but he who is self-existent? The blood of the Lamb had to be poured out for you and me. He prays three times. He has resolve. He gets back up. The, 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 the stress isn't on his face anymore, and he moves on. And he goes through that process, through the, uh, the trial and scourging. And now he goes to Calvary. And on, at Calvary, he's laying there, or he's on the cross, and he talks to the, the thief on the cross beside him. And he gives him the assurance that today, as I tell to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. He gives him the assurance. And then after that, the sins of every one of us who have, who have confessed our sins and given them to Jesus, those things are now coming upon him. Now what does sin do between, between us and our relationship with God? What does it do? It separates us. So for the first time in Jesus' existence... His his sin is no longer a theoretical experience. He is experiencing it for himself. That guilt, that shame, that separation from the Father, he's becoming that for you and me. He is experiencing all of that, the fullness of that, that you and I would feel if we didn't didn't confess our sins. Check out what the book, um, The Desire of Ages, tells us about this experience. This is from the chapter Calvary. And this is what it says. 
Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. You think about that for a moment. Think about what Jesus was experiencing there in those final moments there on the cross. Okay? Yes, Jesus knew. He told, the, he told the disciples and everyone else that I shall rise on the third day. He knew these things. But here now in this moment, as the sin is becoming not theory and not, not, not an idea, but now he's, he's becoming this thing for you and me, and he is drinking now this death that you and I deserve, something in his eyes he cannot see through the portals of the tomb. And yet he could have called it off right then and there. You know that? He could have said, Lord, Father, send the angels. They were chomping at the bit, I imagine, ready just to, to step in. You know, they, they didn't quite understand this either. They could have stepped in just like that. He could have called them down just like that. Stopped the whole show. Okay? But he didn't. So why did he drink this bitter cup? Okay? Why did he drink this bitter cup? Look what Isaiah chapter 51. So you don't have to, right? Look what Isaiah 51, 22 says. Thus says your Lord, the Lord and your God, who pleads the cause of his people. Aren't you glad that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ? He pleads our cause, doesn't he? It says this, See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it. When Jesus is there on the cross and he is having these things come upon him, all this weight of guilt and sin come upon him, he could have called the thing off, but he knew that there was something that would be a benefit for him to see this through, and that was to see you with an empty cup in your hand. Isaiah, I mean Hebrews, excuse me. By the way, notice this, this quote we just read. Did Jesus in this moment... Was he thinking about his self-preservation? Because if he was thinking about his self-preservation, he very well could have called off the whole thing, right? But what was he thinking about? Why did he drink this cup for you and me? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Let us run uh, with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy that was set before Jesus, brothers and sisters, was to see you. Each and every one of you with an empty cup in your hand. That you could have now the opportunity, the chance. Because again, salvation isn't a guarantee in a sense. Okay, When he died, it wasn't a guarantee that everyone in the whole world would accept him. Right? This was simply providing an opportunity for everyone to by faith, by faith enter into this relationship with him, to allow him to be uh, their Lord and Savior. And when he went through the cross and all that he laid down, he saw us with an empty cup in our hands. Think about the weight of the value of what Jesus has done for us, what he laid down, how he humbled himself, and he came to this earth to become sin for you and me. Now, when I get through a, a, a difficult time and I say, you know what, man, maybe God doesn't love me anymore. Have you ever felt like that sometimes? Have you ever felt like, don't raise your hands if you don't want to, right? Have you ever felt like, man, things are going so hard right now. Is God even, does he even care? Is he even listening? Does he know what I'm going through? Brothers and sisters, if he would go through all of this for you and me, I am sure he is attentive 
to our cries. He is attentive to our pain. He is attentive to our trials. He knows what the devil is trying to do to discourage you. He knows what is knocking on your door. He knows what the doctor called and told you about this week. He knows these things, and yet he loves you. And yet he wants to fight for you. And yet, at the same time, what do we do? We say, Lord, you don't care. But look at the value of what he's paid for us. If he has laid out his life and has become sin for you and me, brothers and sisters, surely with that he will provide to us the the necessary means for our salvation. And the good news is, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the, the life, the resurrection. He holds the keys of death and everything. Okay? And no matter what we face in this earth, no matter what trials we go through, no matter what kind of heartbreak and sorrow, Jesus will make all things new. Is that good news, brothers and sisters? He will make all things new. Last Friday, we celebrated, not this yesterday, but the week before, it was Passover. Okay? And it doesn't always happen like that when we celebrate Easter, that it's in a, a, a chronologi- uh, you know, chronologically. Uh, in order, is that I'm saying that right? You get the idea, right? Um, it doesn't always fall into where Friday is Passover, okay? And, uh, but you remember the first Passover when the children of Israel were in Egypt and Jesus was going to go and deliver them. He sent Moses to be the active agent in that, in that part. The last plague was the, the angel of death. And they were forewarned. They said, hey, listen, the angel of death is going to come by tonight, and he's going to kill the firstborn of every home. The only way to get out of this, the only way to protect yourself and your family, is to make sure that you have a sacrifice, uh, a lamb, and you take the blood of the lamb and you put it on the doorpost of your home. So that way the angel, he, and he's traveling, uh, and he's coming near your home, he will see it and he will pass over your home. Okay? Let me ask you, if you were the oldest child that day, that afternoon, <clears throat> Dad, <clears throat> I, uh, I noticed that raking the leaves is important right now, but uh, Dad, it's getting kind of late, you know, sometime around here, these plagues, sometimes it gets dark early, I don't know, hey, let, uh, let's just go ahead and do this now, you know, let's, uh, let's not wait, all right, let's make sure we get the blood on the doorpost, Dad, come on now, let's, I'll help you if you want me to help you, um, you know, I'll go round up the goat and everything, I'll get the lamb and everybody, okay, I would have been very excited If I was the firstborn, okay? This would have been very real for me, okay? This would have been very present in my life. I wanted to make sure that the blood was put on the the doorpost, right? Today, brothers and sisters, the offer remains that you and I can have the blood of the Lamb to cover us and to protect us. Do you want the blood of the Lamb to cover you today? Do you want the blood of the Lamb to cover your household today? This week, when you're sitting down and you're thinking about what you're going to read, pray, God, show me your beauty. Show me your grace. Show me your power. Show me your salvation. And God, forgive me for how I have doubted your love by my own actions and my disbelief. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And he's ready. The sacrifice has been made. His table is set, and he is ready to welcome you into the kingdom. Now, I don't usually do this, but I do want to make a, 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 an appeal. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or anything like that, but to talk to me afterwards. If you say, you know, I've never been baptized before. I've never been baptized, and I want to be baptized. Okay, like, like Jesus was baptized. Okay, I want to be baptized like this. I want to give my life to him and be baptized. Or if you say, I want to be rebaptized. Okay, I want you to talk to me after the service, all right? Because I think that's something that is, uh, in our experience, it's an opportunity for us to give our lives to Jesus. And guys, notice this. When the children of Israel, they got into their house that night, okay, for the Passover, had the blood on the, on the doorpost, did the people have to be perfect in every single way, fashion, and form before putting the blood on the doorpost and getting inside the house? No. We, by faith, claim the promise We by faith claim the blood of the Lamb. And there's no better time than right now to give our hearts to Jesus. Colossians 1.14, it tells us, In whom 
we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, God, we thank you so much that you love us beyond even, even loving yourself. You love us more than you love yourself. And that's it's so hard for us to grasp. It's so hard to, to, to put this into a, um, a tangible aspect, a tangible understanding. But God, we by faith, we want to enter into the sacrifice that you've made for us. And that Jesus, that your blood would wash us and forgive us of our sins. And that Jesus, you would fill us with the fullness of peace, the fullness of of the assurance of the salvation that you provided to us, that the sacrifice is complete, and that, Jesus, we can by faith enter into the sanctifying relationship with you. We ask that the Holy Spirit would be given to us to, to, to put us our feet on the right path and to give us that first love experience once again. And I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here and for those uh, who are considering being baptized again or giving their lives for the first time through baptism. I pray, Jesus, that you would draw them to that. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn is going to be number 223. Please... I want to welcome everybody to stay after. We have a potluck here in the fellowship hall, and I think it's all ready for us. And so let's go ahead and have a prayer for that as well together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for your love and your kindness. And God, we want to pray that you would be with us this week as we leave this place and that you would draw our hearts to you, God. And I pray, pray Lord, that you continue to be the author and the finisher of our faith, to take our story in your hands, Lord, and continue to write your beautiful grace into our life. And Father, now we also ask that you would please bless this food that we're going to partake in.
our time and fellowship together and be with us now. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.